Let me start by recalling and detailing the workflow that I've already sketched in the motivation section. So, of course, we start with a problem. Then the first step is to model this problem, that is to represent it formally in form of a logic program. And as already said, this is normally not a single logic program, it's at least two, one for the problem class, the actual encoding, and one for the problem instance, which is usually a set of facts. Okay, then this logic program usually still contains variables, so it's parsed and then grounded by the grounder, in our case Gringo the grounder, and then afterwards we obtain a variable free, a ground logic program, which is solved by the solver, and this simply means that the solver computes its stable models, and then these stable models are either passed to a user or to a backend that then does something with it, so it's more or less interpreted and a solution is obtained. So ASP as such, the solving process is, consists of these two components, grounding and solving, and hence ASP has these three tasks, modeling, grounding and solving in the workflow. Good. What is, I'd say, specific about it is whenever there is, well again, we talk about elaboration tolerance, a change either in the original problem or perhaps you discovered a bug because something was in the stable model, you can elaborate the original problem specification. And here, this loop, more or less uh, solving in the, in, the, in the term grounding and solving, and then seeing something in the stable model, oh, that is it hints at a change of the logic program. This loop is very, very tight, and the distance from, from the output to modifying the program is very, very short much, much shorter than, for instance, in a programming language like C++, right, where if something isn't really right, it takes you quite a while to figure out where in the source code, and in particular, if you haven't written all the source code here, in the logic programs that you will see in the rest are really succinct and short, and it's rather easy. It's directly, and, and the symbols are directly related, more or less, to the output, so it's easy to elaborate the problem specification in case something didn't work out in the end, or something changed. Okay, so anyway, this is more or less the overview, and let's now detail all these particular uh, it, parts of the workflow with an example. At the beginning is a problem. So for us, I have chosen graph coloring as the exemplar to illustrate to you the basic cornerstones of the ASP's uh, workflow. And so we first have to understand what the problem is and what we're dealing with. So in our case, in graph coloring, we color graphs, and a graph, you may all know, right, a graph consists of nodes and edges. And um, here's the example that we are using uh, in the SQL. So we have a graph. This is actually a directed graph, and you may argue, well, then let's take arcs instead of edges, but it's not important, right? So here we have six nodes and some edges between them, and this is the problem instance already. And now the first thing we have to think about is how do we represent this graph in terms of facts. And so what we have to choose are predicate names first. Well, here it's not perhaps so difficult. We can just take node and edge. And node is a unary predicate, so it has one argument. And edge is a binary predicate, which has two arguments. And this is more or less the notation that we use to do that. Again, this is these are the predicate names I have chosen. It's a directed arc. You may want to use perhaps arc instead of edge. It's not important, right? You model, I model, we do different things and both are very beautiful, right? So modeling is really very individual and there's no unique solution to things. Even when you solve this problem, you may come up with something else than I do. Okay, anyway, so we have nodes and edges and we want to color this guy, so we also have to talk about the colors and I just simply introduce a unary predicate color uh, that describes the colors that we have. Here you may argue that is color something that belongs to the instance or is it something that belongs to the encoding that also encodes the problem class? Because you may talk about coloring with two colors, three colors, four colors, so where does it belong? I just put it to the instance. Now that we've seen more or less how we can describe the entities that we, that we want to color, the graphs, let's look at the problem description. And here the problem class is, or the task that we have to solve, I'll just read this now, assign each node one color so such that 
No two nodes connected by an edge have the same color. Whoa, that's quite a heavy description, right? And well, this is a very dense description and normally what, what you will face in a, in, in, in a real world scenario is text and text and text and you have to get the constraints out of this. And this is actually a non-trivial process that normally takes uh, interviews and, and sometimes weeks and months until you really got all the constraints right because they are not formulated in, in the way that you like them. So actually this specification is also not something that I could now directly map onto an ASP encoding. So I have rewritten it. So I've uh, more or less taken out two constraints that are equivalent to, to the description there. And the idea is to say, okay, first of all, each code has, each node has one color. So this is a functional, functional constraint. Whenever you have a node, it can only have one color and not two or not three or not none, right? So you have to color every node and with exactly one color. Good. Well, I'm a bit pedantic here, yes, but I think that that's important because we are now about to formalize the problem and being pedantic is a part of this. And not everybody likes you for that, actually. Okay, then the next constraint is once you have uh, given each node uh, or assigned each node a color, then you have to make sure that whenever you have two connected nodes, that they are not colored in the same way. Because if you just fulfill the first constraint, you may actually color your whole graph in red or in green or in blue, right? It's just the second, the second constraint that makes sure that all adjacent nodes have a different color. Okay, now let's actually see how this looks like formulated in terms of a logic program. And this logic program is a formal problem representation of the previously let's say, informally given problem. Of course, we, well, we gave it in natural language and we try to be as precise as possible, but it's just now that we really make things precise because now we have also precise semantics of what a logic program is. Anyway, that's something you've seen in the last part. Let's now look at the logic program capturing our problem. So I'm giving you here authentic ASP code that you could cut and paste from the slide and, and, and run. And also I will explain on the fly some language constructs to you uh, that may not be so obvious to you. But again, the goal here is to understand the workflow and well, on the way to learn by osmosis some of the language constructs. Now here I describe the six nodes. This is actually an abbreviation, writing these two dots for node one, node two, node three, node four, node five, node six. Okay, so it's ju just because I'm lazy, I could have written all these things individually and, and keep in mind that every statement in a logic program must be terminated in real life by a dot. Then I've taken the graph that you've seen before and written down all the edges that it, that it has. Uh, keep in mind, so for instance, one to three and three to one, this is of course the directional uh, these are arcs, so there's a, it's, it's, it's a directed graph, but again, it doesn't matter here that much. Okay, then I've chosen three colors, red, blue, and green, and this now constitutes what I called before the problem instance. Okay, now let's look at the problem class. The problem class is captured in ASB by a corresponding problem encoding. And in our case, this encoding must account for the two constraints that each node must be assigned exactly one color and two connected nodes must not be assigned the same color. So we've talked about elaboration tolerance before and there the, the idea was to say, okay, a small change in the world must also be reflected by a small change in the specification. But this actually uh, continues in the way that um, each constraint in the real world should also be reflected by a constraint or a rule or several rules, but at least in a modular way uh, in the ASP encoding, in the problem specification. Now let's see how this works here now with us in ASP. Now the first constraint says each node must be assigned exactly one color. And this is the logic programming rule that accounts for that. Let's see what it says, right? So we here we have our if. So if we have a node n, then, and looking at all the possible colors, we can assign n to red, to blue, or to green. That is, after grounding here, we will have in this set 
three possible assignments for a single node. So if we take node uh, 5, right, we make color 5 with red, blue or green. But among these possibilities, we are only allowed to select exactly one. That's another way of writing that. You could also write a 1 to the left end and a 1 to the right end by not using the equality. So this is the constraint that captures, well, our in initial constraint that each node must be assigned exactly one color. Now again, if you just take this the problem instance and, and this constraint, you push the button, give it to an ASP server, you may get solutions where everything is painted in red, everything is painted in green, or in everything in half red, half green, but because we have not yet excluded candidate solutions in which adjacent nodes get the same color. And this is done with an integrity constraint, which says that, oh, if I have two nodes, N and M, that are connected, I must not, and this is again, this is the negative, it, must, it cannot be the case that two connected nodes N and M have been assigned the same color. And that's it. This is the problem in coding. And we see actually that both of these uh, ASP rules reflect more or less in a one-to-one -one way the constraints in our natural language description. Also, they, and this is again a, a little spoiler to the methodology later on, they nicely reflect the methodology of writing ASP because the first rule can be seen as a generator of solution candidates. As mentioned, it also generates candidates which more or less are um, no solutions in the end because you painted everything in red or in green, right? And then here you have a tester. So the idea is once, you've, once you have uh, seen this rule here, you can assume that you have assigned predicates for each node the color has been assigned. And then here you test, right, the edge predicate is given and then the assign has been generated by this guy. And then you, then you simply test what solution candidate was produced. And so here you have a generator and here you have a tester. Again, this is methodology, right? It's the way you write things down. It's like, I don't know, if you want to write about, uh, learn about uh, how to write Java or C++ programs, you have a meter or two meters of books, right? That just describe how to write down nice Java or C++ program. Here the idea is, think in terms of writing a generator part, that generate solution candidates and then you evaluate them and filter out the real solution. And this is more or less a prototypical example of this methodology. Okay, so this already shows you first of all how we, that we have a uniform problem encoding. We have a problem instance and a problem encoding. And this problem encoding will allow us to solve all three, color, three colorability problems where edges and nodes are represented by these predicates. Right? Okay, so now you have that you've seen the uh, problem representation, let's see actually how it is processed. So to this end, we give both of them names. So we, we color the, the instance graph, why not? And I just give it the extension LP, but that doesn't really matter. And then the encoding is called color. And so we have two, two files, one for the problem instance, one for the problem class. And now we can use them for processing. The first step in processing the logic programs is to ground them. That is to eliminate all first order variables, all object variables, by systematically um, replacing them by um, terms. And what we obtain then is a variable free, a ground logic program. Let's just see how our grounder, Gringo, solves this problem. So what I did here, I, this is just the, the shell prompt, right? I call Gringo and with this option minus minus text, I say give me a human readable output and I use as then as further input the problem instance and the problem encoding. And now what I show you here is more or less the output, the result of grounding, which I more or less added a little bit that, to put it on the slide, but it's principally exactly what is output. So this is more or less the, what we already have in the, in the, in the file graph.lp in the problem instance, with the only exception that now the, the, the notation of, of node from 1.6 has been expanded to the six facts. As I said, this is only a convenient, convenience feature that allows us to write things in a more compact way. So this is more or less the part that accounts for the problem instance. 
And now where the real variables actually were sitting is of course the encoding and this is in the file color.lp. But keep in mind, these two files are the input. The, the, the result is just one uh, variable free, one ground program um, that is then further processed by the solver. So what we see first of all here is the choice construct, right? So keep in mind that the solver does simplifications. These are the facts that result from our first constraint. Let's, let me jump back briefly. This is what we get by grounding this constraint. But keep in mind that we already know that node 1, node 2 or so are facts and that they are true. Hence, this part here is simplified away. In the same way, just anticipating it, we also have edge as facts which are true and they will also be simplified away in the grounding. Anyway, let's come back. So what we then have here are for choice rules where for each node, node 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, we have three alternatives of assigning a color. We can assign 6 color red, blue and green. And here we see actually that, these are, that in this set we use the semicolon for separating uh, the entities. Um, I will come to explaining this later on. Okay, this is more or less what we get after grounding the first constraint. Now the second constraint was an integrity constraint. And here again we get quite a bunch, right? Well here we got just six constraints. Here we have for each edge, and this is now three constraints. This is the one that rela relates one to two. This is more or less uh, what we get here by looking at this fact. So it cannot be the case that we color one and two with the same color. So we cannot assign one color red and two color red. Or we cannot assign, or end if you like, we cannot also not assign one color blue and two color blue. And finally, just to repeat this, we cannot assign at the, at the same time one color green and two color green. And now for each edge, we then get three uh, integrity constraints. And you already see that this is well, quite a quite quite a little explosion that is happening here because I'm already omit omitting stuff. So we see actually that going from the a non-ground logic program to a ground program uh, may actually be a bottleneck in terms of size explosion. But these are all things we will see or you will experience when you model. That's something always to keep an eye on, right? Okay. So I was only using now Gringo, but you could have this very same effect by just by using uh, Klingo here. And by telling Klingo, oh, just give me the textual output, that would work just as fine. Okay, now that we have witnessed the first processing step, the grounding, let's see actually what the solver, CLASP, is doing with this um, input. So we now look at the solver. The solver now simply takes the output of the grounder as its input. That is, it takes the variable free, the ground logic program produced by the grounder, and computes the, its stable models. Now, this is again uh, just in a very rudimentary way, right? You have here the, the, sh the, the shell prompt. I launch Gringo on, on the problem instance and the problem encoding. And now I do not give the option that it should be human readable. So by default, it's machine readable. And then I, and what the output that is pro produced here is piped as the input into CLASP the solver. And the parameter zero indicates that class should enumerate all stable models. If you do not give this, only one stable model will be produced. And then, well, once you push the button or you hit the return key, you get six uh, stable models and they correspond to different colorings of our graph. And you see, this is really a simple example. So there's no, well, solving took almost no time. It's more or less just Nothing is happening. This is more or less noise, right? The example is so simple. But anyway, you see that there are six different um, six different solutions. Each one is 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 here that uh, there's the keyword answer. Then there is a one, two, three until six, and then the atoms are printed. And I omitted more or less the obvious atoms because you know that there are six nodes. You know the edges, and these would also be be, be printed as part of the answer. There are actually commands to restrict the output, but again, this is now too detailed. Okay, so this is actually what the solver gives us, six stable models that corresponds to six different colorings. And of course, we can do the same with Klingo. Well, before we, can, we would take 
Gringo, take and pipe it into, into the output of Gringo into Clasp, but you can do, do the very same by directly calling Klingo and under the hood it will first call Gringo and then it will call uh, Clasp. And just by passing the problem instance, problem encoding and the zero to tell it, oh, please enumerate all stable models. Okay, now that we have the stable models, we have to interpret them. That's somehow straightforward in the sense that you pick, what, let's say one, I now pick the, the, the six stable model, and either you look at this as a human, which we do in the course more or less, right? Or you visualize this or you pipe this into an, uh, another system that, that works as a backend, etc. right? So in our case, now coloring the graph that we've seen before, this is the solution. So one and five are colored with red. So here five is colored with red and here one is colored with red. Then three and two are colored with green, three with green, two with green, and finally six and four are colored with blue. Here's six with blue, and here's four with blue, right? This is now the solution. And this then comes back and completes the workflow. So, I hope that this gave you a taste of how ASP systems work. And now we come back to the methodology how to write ASP programs.